All right, everybody. Wow. Can you hear me? I was, I was like it louder. It's not loud for us up here, but you can hear me. So that's good. Tell me if you can't hear me. Actually, that's a, always a funny thing. Tell me if you can't hear me. That doesn't really make sense. I had another one, which is like, raise your hand if you've never raised your hand before. It's like, that's, you can do that. Um, I'm Dan Davis. I work at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. And I'm here with Sina Barham. Did I say that right? That's right. Okay, I actually said his name right. From Prime Consulting, I'm sure you have seen Sina around the conference. Today we're going to be talking about uh, accessibility in mobile apps, two approaches to accessibility. Um, we're looking at uh, two examples. One is the work that Sina has done on the mobile part of the um, accessible experience at the Canadian Muse Museum of Human Rights, which to me really represents kind of a, a bit of a revolutionary idea, you know, making a museum fully accessible. And when, when Sina tells me it is the most accessible museum in the world, I tend to believe him since he worked on that. Um, and also at the National Museum of the American Indian, where I work, where we are really taking an incremental approach. We are, we are trying some experiments. Um, we are failing forward, I think. And we're trying to make sure we mo keep moving forward. Um, you're going to see some of the things that we're, we're trying. You might see some colleagues that are already uh, doing more than we are. But I think it presents an opportunity to sort of talk about universal design in general and also how it works well in accessibility in, in apps. So um, just real quickly before I toss it to you, Sina, uh, universal design uh, is often referred to as inclusive design. And it offers a broad spectrum of ideas meant to produce buildings, products, environments that are inherently accessible. And this I want to emphasize for older people, for people without disabilities, and for people with disabilities. So I think it's kind of important to think about people without disabilities. Well, when, when I think about accessibility, I really think about availability. So this is making things available um, to, to everybody. And so I think a good question maybe uh, for Sina to talk about is what is accessibility? Sure, so, <clears throat> sorry about that. Let's, all right, there we go. Um, so basically uh, accessibility is, is an interesting term because technically it means reachability, right? Or availability. If something's accessible, uh, it doesn't even have to refer to persons with disabilities talking about it uh, or, or, or interacting with it, uh, but rather just that, uh, it, that, it, that it's available, that, that it's reachable, able to be accessed. But we, we tend in the accessibility community to overload this term. And it's really, oh, it works great with a screen reader. It, um, uh, the video is captioned. There's audio description, et cetera, et cetera. The things that we all refer to as access in the, in the museum space. And so um, it's just important to keep in mind, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, these are labels, these are words, but inclusive design or universal design um, is really the, the goal here. And accessibility to me is an outcome. It's a, it's a side effect of doing inclusive design correctly. And so... Um I, I did give a definition of universal design, but maybe you want to talk no, a little no, I bit. Think that was, I think that yeah. was great. We can just uh, uh, jump to the examples and start from there. Sure. Awesome. So let's talk about some examples of universal design. Fantastic. So before I do that, let's get some, some baseline here. So everybody in the audience say I. I. All right. That's how I know how many people are here. Now, how many of you are uh, uh, familiar with universal design or inclusive design? All right. Um, so what we've got on the screen here is, uh, what did I refer to it a couple of nights ago? The cliche curb cut slide, right? So um, it, it's kind of cliche because it's the one that everybody uses for universal design. This came out of uh, a sort of a, a disabilities-focused um, uh, architecture approach to, 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 to society, right? Uh, you've got curbs. That's really tough if you're a wheelchair user, right? Um, because, you know, you're hopping the curb, then you're going to have to hop the other one. It's just, like, not fun. So what do we do? Well, we'll, we'll make curb cuts. So curb cuts, you guys are familiar with this, right? The the ramp at the sidewalk that goes down? By the way, nodding yes. does not work. Yes. Okay, cool. Just, just to cover that. For those of you who did not see me come in here for a cane, you might also be blind. Um, so, uh, no, uh, so, so yeah, that's awesome. Um, but here's the thing, right? Like, then we found a problem. And the problem was, next slide, that somebody with um, uh, somebody using a cane, like somebody who's blind, might uh, uh, be walking down the sidewalk, right, uh, experiencing experiencing maybe a slight incline, but not much, and not realize they're in the middle of the street. So that's that's you know that's no fun. And the idea here is that um, we want to make sure that we iterate on that. We don't just say, oh well, you know, that was it for curb cuts. It was a great idea. Uh, instead, what we're going to do is. Uh, uh, 
put some foot braille on it. So those bumps that you see on there, that's called foot braille. It's fantastic. It gives you a textural feedback for going forward. And so it's an it's an iteration. It's an addition that doesn't detract from a wheelchair user. Doesn't detract from you know people with uh, uh, strollers or, or, or luggage at the airport, as I mentioned the other day. But it also then helps somebody who's using a cane and you know walking forward that way. And then if you'll forgive me for one second, the slides are acting up over here, but luckily that's to be expected given the demo gods. So here we go. All right. So I'm just going to refresh this. Here we go. All right. Um, so a couple of other examples um, is uh, things like, uh, for example, um, a electric toothbrush. So uh, the uh, next slide. I'm sorry, I didn't yeah, mention I that. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, the, the, how, how many in here? Uh, how, how many people here are like own an electric toothbrush? Uh, all right, cool. How about a manual toothbrush, like an old school one? Oh yeah. All right. How many of you don't care about your teeth at all? <laughs> right, you should get on that. Um, so uh, the thing is, it's great from a hygiene point of view. It's 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 great from a you know mechanical kind of ease of use uh, uh, point of view, but. It's not just something that's you know more efficient from that perspective. Imagine having a a, a difficulty with with muscles or lifting something or just making a repetitive motion. You know, there's a lot of things involved in doing that that we just take for granted if we have the use of our hands or or shoulders. I mean, a shoulder injury and it's just really tough. And so as a result, a a, a an automatic uh, vibrating toothbrush or uh, automatic toothbrush electric toothbrush is a, is a mechanism by which um, it, we're incorporating inclusive design uh, into a product. Um, other things are things like, uh, for example, a the light switch, right? So you've got the little, you, you guys know the, like the little nub light switches. Remember those, right? And then there's the the flat bar ones um, that are that are you know kind of smoother. They're really easy to actuate. You can actually just hit it with the edge of your elbow or something like that. So again, it doesn't really hurt anybody. It's it's, a, it's an improvement on the previous product, and uh, it it ends up being critical though for somebody who might not be able to articulate their fingers that way. So this is this idea of inclusive design. Last example I'll go over is you know something like a talking pill bottle. I got ov the obvious use case here is. Um, you're blind, you can't see the label, that's fantastic. But there's a lot of other use cases, like, for example, I don't remember how many, you know, what the dosage is supposed to be, and I don't have my contacts in. You push the little button, it talks. Maybe you're in a different country, and the pharmacist speaks uh, uh, English, if you're an English speaker, and can record those uh, for you in, in, a, in a talking pill bottle. So it's, again, ideas where it might be critical for one user, but it's still helpful for, for everybody. Does that all make sense? Aye. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so uh, the seven principles of universal design, and so I, I don't want to, uh, you know, dwell on these too much. But there are, there is a, there is a formal framework. So when we refer to universal design, there's actually this this set of seven principles. Um, I have a blog post on this if you're interested about how like I related this to museum exhibits, and so this is. Um, uh, a, a set of rules or a set of guidelines that I feel don't only apply to the physical space, even though that's where they were conceived for, but they also apply to digital projects, uh, a, a mobile app, a website, things like that. So let's let's dive into this. So uh, principle one, right? Um, equitable use, and you know the key thing here is equitable, right? It's not an equal experience that you're going for, and or, or an equivalent experience. It's an equitable one, and the, and the reason for that is, look, sometimes it's just not going to be possible. If something is a, is a, is a visual uh, uh, thing, an equitable experience might be all sorts of stuff. Description of that thing, an audio representation, uh, the mapping of colors to textures with uh, 3D printing and, and you know, you know, thermal interfaces. I mean, there's a whole variety of things we can do. But it's not an equivalent interface. It's, it's an equitable experience. And so this is really uh, key, I feel, to keep in mind. Because sometimes you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And what we end up doing is saying, oh my god, that is like totally not going to be possible if you can't hear, or totally not possible if you can't see. And then we stop before even trying something that, that could really approach the same takeaways. Um, and the uh, picture that we see here is a uh, example of a wind um, exhibit from um, uh, Museum of Science up in Cambridge. And so this uh, was an idea where uh, there's wind turbines on the roof of the museum. Uh, they're generating electricity at different rates because there are different, you know, there are different uh, widths on the on the paddles. There's different uh, engines and different conversions. So some operate better at lower wind speeds, some operate better at higher, et cetera, et cetera. And there, all this data is being graphed. And the takeaway here is, well, okay, not like this, this blind fifth grader walks into the museum. 
what do you do? I mean, there's just like this visual bar chart, which is really cool to show you the the differences immediately. But how can she access that? And so, uh, we, you know, they did a couple of things. We um, uh, we put a tactile overlay on the screen, right? Because it was a constrained interface. It wasn't an arbitrary thing like an iPhone or an iPad. S so we knew what would always be there, and the grid was okay. So we put a tactile grid over it to show the the widths of the different bars. Um, then when you touch the screen, it just reads out what. Um, is on the screen. The other thing that uh, happens here is that uh, there's sonification as well. So uh, when I say sonification, what I'm referring to is the use of non-verbal audio, non-speech-based audio to convey information. So um, you guys remember a parabola, the U shape from for math, Y equals X squared, right? I promise that's like the only math here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you wanted to sonify that for somebody, I'm doing this in mono, so it's not the greatest, but you would go like, Phew! Right? And, uh, you know, or like Y equals X aligned. And so you can do things like that where uh, you map the different values to pitch and have an alternative way of conveying information. That's what one of the things we did here for uh, showing the different values of the, of, of the wind deficiency. All right, number two. So uh, flexibility in use. I mean, this is this is I think pretty uh, self-evident from if you if you buy into inclusive design, this idea that there needs to be more than one way to achieve something, right? So um, one of the things that we did here was uh, this was uh, out of a workshop in Simi. This was actually also the Museum of Science up in uh, Cambridge, and. Um, the, uh, the the takeaway here is that there's uh, a, a, a um, what what is it a, a biological interface like for for, for like a, it, it measures your uh, hand temperature uh, using a Peltier sensor it, it measures your weight if you jump on a weight sensor all of these kinds of things for Hall of Human Life and then what uh, what we wanted to do is how can somebody who's blind for example uh, estimate their position on the graph compared to all of their classmates, right? Like, oh, I was 98.7, you know, she was 98.5. How, how do you do that? And the way we did this was, uh, this was just a prototype. It came out of like a, a hackathon type thing, but we just put it together. And uh, I had the idea of basically having two different tracks. We just used mice because, you know, then we could get the cursor on the computer. And we put bars on top of it so that when you move the bar uh, uh, in the X or Y position, you get this proprioceptive feedback, this touch-based feedback of what's going on in addition to the digital feedback. So there's multiple ways of conveying the information. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. All right. So it's like the, um, yeah. uh, so the idea here is simple and intuitive in, uh, in, in use, right? So um, sometimes we, we bring, uh, not really sometimes, all of the time, we bring different experiences um, based on our knowledge, based on our previous experiences. And the idea here is that things need to be intuitive so that we don't have this expectation that, oh, you need to know X, Y, and Z to be able to appreciate this content. The sign we see here is a, is a, a sign that says, you know, mujeres in, in, in Spanish, it says it in English, there's braille, there's a pictogram, so there's a variety of ways of conveying information. And this kind of redundant, uh, redundancy is super important for, for inclusive design. All right. So, uh, perceptible information. So the idea here is that there are uh, disturbances in the environment. We work with uh, museums a lot, and sometimes there are screaming children all over. So you can't hard code the, uh, the volume, right? Because that's not going to work. Other times, it's very quiet, so you don't want it to talk too loud. And so this idea is, again, and it, it dovetails with a lot of the other ones, flexibility in use and so forth, where you want to Give the user control, right? Just let them have volume control, and that way they can adjust it. In um, Canadian Museum for Human Rights, on the digital interactives, uh, we have speech built into all the interactives. We have speed control. It's the second question you're asked. The first one is English or French. And so uh, this level of flexibility and this idea of giving the user uh, control over the way that they're experiencing something is, is super important. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm going to lose my voice by the end of this conference. Um, so uh, tolerance for error. The idea here is, uh, and this happens a lot in museum exhibits, right? An exhibit will time out, and then it'll go back to a known starting point. That's the idea here. You you don't want to have the user uh, be in a position where um, I'm sure we all have. Like, how many of us have have felt uh, like we've been using a computer interface and then been like, I I'm just lost right now. Like, this did not do what I wanted it to do. Oh yeah. All right, sure. and like that's a thing, right? And that's not that's not your fault, no matter what the software developer tells you, right? That that's actually, in my opinion, a bug, right? Because you're the user, you had a clear expectation, but conveying that to the computer is something that we're just not very good at these days. We're getting better. It's better than 1995, but there's a long way to go. And so the idea here is that we need to make sure that we're aware of this level of error that's just going to come up all the time. Be have the interface not only be uh, tolerant of this level of error, but actually work around it. The example of course 
course, is a Coke machine. Very simple. You put money in, Coke comes out. If you don't put the money in uh, or the right amount, it doesn't. You can, you know, I, I have to be careful when giving this uh, a, a particular slide in front of a room full of geeks because they're like, oh, well, you know, you can hack a Coke machine by doing, and I'm like, yeah, I, I get it. But, but for the most part, uh, a Coke machine's a very simple, hard to break interface. All right. Um, so low physical effort. We talked about this already um, a couple of nights ago with respect to the double doors versus the doorknob, the worst invention of mankind. And so the idea is that uh, this applies to digital interfaces as well, not just physical ones. So low physical effort, fantastic. It's easy to open a door. It's easy to uh, uh, you know, uh, lift a desk with an electronic or hydraulic uh, interface as opposed to you know, physically needing to lift that, but also in digital interfaces. Something could be accessible. I, I could, for example, get to it with my screen reader. But if I have to tab 30 times to get there, that's not the, the best usability, right? That's not really inclusively designed. So, so keep that in mind when uh, considering making interfaces and considering different ways that people might interact with that experience. All right. And the final one is size and approach. So the idea, uh, size and space for approach. So, so the idea here is that uh, if you're a wheelchair user, you're in a constrained space, it's hard to turn. But again, digital interfaces as well, right? So imagine that uh, what happens when you go to touch an icon on your phone. Uh, the, 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 what you're doing is that your finger is starting to occlude the thing you're about to go touch, right? This is a very known phenomenon. So be, be careful about making things too small or, you know, it's a really tight, sexy, minimal interface. And then all of a sudden, yeah, and also like breaks the second you go to do, you know, anything with it. So uh, this idea of flexibility and having a little bit of awareness of what happens in different use cases cases, I think is uh, really important. Do those all make sense? Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to give it over to Dan pretty soon here, but uh, yeah. really quick. So how do people with uh, disabilities use uh, technology? Let me know if you guys are familiar with this. So who here is familiar with a screen reader? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so it's a program that reads me the screen. I have to listen to it very fast. So if you're interested in that, you can come up after this, uh, and, uh, and I'll show you. Like uh, I'm reading these slides like right now at a thousand words a minute. It's kind of fun to listen to. It sounds like like gibberish. Um, what what so rate are you talking at? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be courteous of your time, man. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I will, I will slow it down a no, little bit. Uh, like Jim, Jim preloaded me with like an entire pint of coffee, and I think it's like I think you're it. at two fifty. Uh, That's uh, right. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, captions. Um, you know, are we are we all familiar with captions? So there's yes. there's text on the screen that is representing what is being said, right? And that's very important just because of uh, a lot of reasons. Not only if you can't hear, but again, the, your, your, your partner is asleep. You still want to watch something. You can turn the captions on. You can search the stuff. So it's great for search engine optimization. And then it'll be a time index into your video content. So all of a sudden, you've made video searchable. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, advantages that emerge from this that are different than the primary advantage that they might have been intended for. Um, zooming in, basically this idea of screen enlargement. You know, there's a reasonable number of blind people. That's great. But there's a lot of low vision people. And so this idea of just making it a little bit bigger uh, is, is a really important thing. In apps, what that relates to is things like use the, uh, the font that is defined by the, the, the system. So in other words, the font size that's defined by the system so that when the, when the user of a phone has said, hey, I want my fonts to be 30% bigger, your app will scale there automatically as opposed to you locking them in to a particular size. So this is really important. Uh, switch users. So um, people here are familiar with uh, Stephen Hawking, for example? Okay, so he's a switch user. He actuates his jaw muscle, right? And by doing that, there's a cursor that's on the screen. He has a binary single, you know, yes or no. But, well, actually, really a, a mono signal, right? Yes. And that cursor, then whatever it's on, that's what gets selected. So, you know, you might have uh, encountered on your phone things like autocorrect, right? Or the suggestions of, of words that you might want to say after this one. Think how incredibly useful that is. That research did not come out to make texting easier. It came out from people trying to research how in the world do I speed up Stephen Hawking from two words a minute to 10 words a minute, right? So that's a really important uh, thing. But yeah, also, it's fantastic if you just make a mistake in your, in your typing. Um, uh, keyboard users, of course. So I'm a keyboard user. I don't use a mouse. And so I think this one's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. And voice input. There's a lot of folks with RSI injuries on their, on their wrist or in my field, computer science. You know, a lot of us have like problems with our hands later on because of all the typing. And so this idea of dictation 
communication and voice input is very important. The way it relates to accessibility and universal design is if you don't have your interfaces semantically correct, you know, semantically marked up correct, things like labels making sense, then uh, you have a problem. Because what ends up happening is the voice user might say, all right, uh, focus the first name field. And the interface won't know what the first name field is because the text is right beside it. But in the code, it hasn't been marked up as first name. Does that make sense? All right. Um, Let's go here. So I'm not going to go over these because uh, it's diving into the you know the, the technical weeds. But if you do have questions on accessibility APIs or how a screen reader actually works underneath and what you can do to make your apps better or what your developers should be aware of, find me. Uh, I, it, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about it. The one thing I'll mention here is the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and the understanding um, here that's important is that uh, this is a set of fantastic guidelines that uh, describe the accessibility of websites. They're also applicable to a lot of other digital projects from apps to exhibits to whatever. And the, um, the, the takeaways from that are things like functional criteria for can people use it uh, with various disabilities and can you access the information in various ways. All those universal design concepts we talked about earlier, they're incorporated in the standard. All right, back over to you, Dan. Sure. Um, of course, if anybody has any any questions uh, at this point, I'm I'm happy to to take them or have Cena take them. Sure. Um, so when when we started the the slide presentation, I said I was going to talk about we we're going to talk about two two examples: the Canadian Museum of of Human Rights and also the work at the Smithsonian. I didn't mean to lie exactly, but let's just say for sake of argument that the Canadian Museum of of Human Rights is implementing all the seven uh, uh, aspects of accessible design. We're not going to really unpack that in deep detail today, um, and I think that it's really inspiring to hear Sinas talk about this stuff, but it can feel quite daunting. It can feel like, well, I, I don't know how, I can't visually describe all my objects. I don't know even where to start. So um, I want to talk a little bit about some incremental steps that we're taking at, at, at my museum. Our mission is the increase in diffusion of knowledge. So it really is a, a mission of accessibility, a mission of availability. So this is a really a natural um, idea. However, it's really the um, the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act that has really spurred a lot of the the accessibility. Um, and we still, um, w when I'm working at my museum, I feel like I'm trying to both reach, to, I'm reaching two audiences. One audience is the visitors to to make things more accessible. And frankly, where I work, the other audience is upper management to say, you know, these are really valuable experiments to do. You know, these are, there's benefits for everyone and there are things that we can do because it's, it, as much as there's lip service to this, it's still very, very difficult to implement these ideas. They tend to be the ideas that uh, drop off a project um, after its inception. So um, we're doing a lot of experiments at the NMAI, as many people are. We've been using beacon technology to um, deliver um, proximity notification so that visitors know there's additional interpretation around. I think we all know what beacons are. I don't think I need to go into that. Okay. Um, and we've been working with a, a company called Story, who's here in the room, um, to deliver those, those experiences. We started working um, outside the museum originally uh, based uh, because uh, I had a lot of content. I had uh, two 30-minute uh, walking tours of the uh, outside of the museum. Um, our museum on the mall, uh, a lot of its uh, mission and story is built into the architecture and the landscape outside that. But it is truly, not to overuse the word, not accessible. It's, um, if you can see it, you know something different is going on, but you really don't know the, the stories behind that. So we made this really terrific uh, walking tour. But I always knew that, again, it wasn't, as usable as I wanted because it represented a huge commitment. Uh, so we wanted to sort of find a way to chop up that information, make them into smaller stories. I looked at GPS, uh, really wasn't argu uh, really didn't work too well, but when beacons came along, we said, hey, here's an opportunity. Uh, let's try it. We ended up with about 35 uh, short stops and throughout our pretty uh, decent size outside uh, the uh, museum, we have 21 proximity notifications that deliver that content. Uh, here you see uh, that we put those beacons out in the trees um, all over the place. We've even uh, buried um, a beacon and we're experimenting with how well that works. Um, our first test with um, one beacon provider revealed that they did not last, the battery power didn't last for very long. We have understood that these uh, Sensoro beacons uh, that operate on AA batteries might last as long as 700 days, but 
again, we will let you know. Um, so this is what the uh, proximity um, notification looks like. There's a story nearby. And really importantly, this is really a best practice here, we've added uh, audio transcripts for these, um, for these stops. So we've done a lot of sound design. I would prefer that you listen to them because I think it's really a great experience. But um, having the audio transcripts ena enable somebody like Cena, who frustratingly might use his voiceover to listen to it all very quickly, but still he's getting that information. And then we know that um, we expect that there'll be multilingual support, so we can use machine translation to uh, provide additional support, again, accessible support for more audiences as, as that becomes more and more available. So um, the, na the uh, Great Inca Road, Engineering and Empire is an exhibition that opened at my museum at the end of July this year. And as we were experimenting with beacons, I really wanted to see if we could experiment in the gallery as well. I didn't really have in my media plan a plan to create a tour of the exhibition. I didn't really have the capacity to do that. But as to, after talking to Sina a bit, um, he made the comment that... Um, oops. He made the comment that, I was looking, trying to figure this out, that the tombstone information that we include in the gallery um, has a lot of information. You know, even without the visual description, of course we want to have the visual description, but for him to know that this is an Inca male figurine, it's from the coast of Peru, um, it comes from these dates, that's a decent amount of information. He even said, because he's a super genius, that he could write an algorithm in five minutes that would turn that into a readable um, uh, sentence, so I'm waiting for that, but that would be, <laughs> that would be great. It's been more than five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but so that got me to thinking that, well, geez, we have a lot of information already. What if we um, experimented and created an experience where we just put the exhibition script into the app and we make all that available um, into the CMS of story? So that's what we've done. We've added uh, 11 beacons that align with 11 sections in this uh, exhibition. And uh, visitors would get proximity alerts saying, okay, here are the stories or here are the elements in this section that are nearby. And these um, have all of the exhibition text. Uh, they have all of the images. Again, this was kind of an important thing to think about. I think when we first started to talk to Sina about how to make this experience and target a, a low sight and blind audience, he very quickly corrected us and said, well, you know, why would you not include the images? Why are we creating a mode that's an accessibility mode? We don't want a mode. We want it, something that works for, for everybody. So we hired Sina to work with Story and give them a, a sort of a spreadsheet, um, a punch list of, of ways to make the app more accessible, which they worked to implement for this, for this test. And the only thing I'll, I'll add there is the, the criteria for doing that is nothing, is nothing magical, right? It's the functional criteria laid out in, in WCAG, that web content accessibility guidelines I talked about. But there, I know that it says web in the name, but it's actually applicable to, to apps as well. So that's the, the, the methodology that was used uh, to go through uh, an app or an exhibit or even a website. So we've done um, a small amount of visitor testing with blind users in the gallery. And we found that um, it was a very positive response. They're very appreciative of this. Um, I think uh, this is an experience where we're really giving um, uh, blind visitors a chance to sort of um, have access to this information. Now, I think you might immediately a ask yourself, and I th these blind users ask the same thing, well, why wouldn't I just stay at home and read this? Well. I think we know that blind visitors tend to visit with other people who might not be blind. I don't know if you often visit with other blind visitors or sighted visitors, but it enables Sina to uh, be able to converse without relying on somebody else to deliver information that's readily available. So this is um, an, an experience that we think is, is really valuable. We also think that it's um, been really interesting to look at um, how providing transcripts is uh, really uh, uh, many visitors really rely on that even if there's audio they say you know I actually prefer to read that so thanks for including that which was sort of surprising to me but again we realize again again there's many different visitors to our museums they what they want to access things in different ways so this this transcript thing is is really important because it's like well I've captioned it aren't, aren't I good like I'm good for deaf people right I can move on but the thing is that that offering transcripts is really helpful just for different learning styles you might have somebody who's uh, not a, uh, a a visual learner where where the text coming up dynamically uh, is going to be good from a processing point of view so having that text available so they can scroll it at their 
speed or enlarge it. Or for example, for me, I might just want to read the content because I don't really want to commit, you know, to the to the audio interface just right now. But I can just listen to a screen reader, read it to me very quickly. So there's a time savings there as well. So that's why having this in, in different formats uh, is 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 very helpful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to that end, many uh, other visitors, sighted visitors, look at the transcript mm -hmm. and say, "Yeah, actually, I would like to listen to this. This is going to be yeah. very interesting." And then, uh, again, we have this kind of uh, metadata where you have these transcripts. It goes back into the back end. It makes it more searchable and findable um, for uh, archiving. Uh, so. Um, I, I talked just a little bit about the testing. It wasn't entirely perfectly um, a perfect experience. The beacons have been tuned pretty well. Um, and so the proximal uh, notifications do do work. They give some semblance of control. There's a lot of variability, as I'm, you've probably heard from other sessions, uh, across devices. So it's, it's difficult to tune those so that they um, are, are accurate enough. Uh, we we do believe that with the advent of blue dot technology, this will be even more exciting for low sight and blind visitors. So we can, with a pretty de decent degree of certainty, say this is what's in front of you. There are these things next to you. Uh, but this is not an experience that we're doing right now. We're just saying here's a proximal alert. This is what's in this general place as a place to start. Um, but let me um, talk about some best practices of mobile, and that will also reveal some of the limitations of our, our test so far. So like I mentioned, um, one of the first uh, the, uh, par parts that we did is we talked to a Story and uh, Sina about uh, redesigning the back end using universal design. Um, and so that was those, those, um, that, that uh, feedback was given to a Story, and they did a, a a good job implementing most of it. However, they still have some work to be done. So we had users, um, blind users, um, testing this that ended up in sort of a cul-de-sac of, of where they couldn't get out of, of things. And it was really interesting to investigate um, you know, what worked, what didn't. Uh, a lot of the back-end work was simple things like labeling, things that sighted visitors wouldn't, wouldn't be aware of, but um, are, you know, it's incredibly important to make it usable. So we talked about the importance of including that audio on video transcript as well. Um, I've included the exhibition text and images. I'd say that's a best practice. It's pretty easy to do. You already have it. So why not stick it on in your mobile experience uh, so it make it more available? Um, now here's something where we, we still have on our to-do list that maybe some of you don't, but we really are planning to include a visual description of the gallery or the space. So each of the th 11 sections we will visually describe. So we'll say, you're in a room that's 50 feet long, there are 18 objects on one side of the wall, there's a timeline above that, and the timeline says, because that's one thing I didn't actually include, include the timeline, so you probably want it, you probably want that, right? You want everything. Sure. Because you want to understand what we're talking about. Okay. So, but di visually describing the room gives an orientation, um, and I, I don't think it's to me, it, it makes less sense to visually describe the entire exhibition space. This is a 9,000 square foot exhibition with a lot of different rooms. That I don't know would be as useful as this is the room you're about to go into. Well, I'll say one quick thing about the the, the room overview thing because I think it's it, it, it's important, which is that um, if you if you think about um, so you, let, let's just I, I, I try to um, uh, concentrate on all audiences here, but but for a second let's just single out a blind visitor for a second. So they uh, might come into a room, and I'll, I'll go into a room and. Uh, the interface here is audio, right? I mean, there's other things, sight, smells and sounds, uh, smells and you know textures and such. But for the most part, let's say somebody's talking to you about that room. So it's a layered experience. And the idea here is that by giving that overview first, by giving that sort of a priori knowledge of, all right, here's the the layout. And then when I talk about the next X, Y, Z, A, B, C topics that I'll talk to you about, uh, it contextualizes that. So that kind of overview, that's why that's important. And it applies not only to physical spaces, but digital interfaces. So my screen reader will, will say things like, list of 10 items before I go into a list. It gives me that heads up, okay, this is what you're in for. So that's why that kind of overview is important. And, and as we move forward with developing these experiences, providing that greater granularity, so if seen as at in front of one object, he knows there are eight ad objects coming up, or two objects behind him, or one object on the cross. Th those are really interesting opportunities that we're going to hopefully be able to implement or look to you uh, as our colleagues to in inspire us and in how, how to best achieve that. So uh, 
one of the very obvious things for low sight and blind is visual descriptions of objects. Uh, we at the Smithsonian have done some experiments with crowdsourcing uh, to have our visitors help describe objects. That work um, continues in an IMLS grant with the Peabody Essex Museum, and we're going to report on that when we get a little further along. Other work at the MCA looks really, really interesting. Sina, if you wouldn't mind talking about their approach to visual description and automation. Sure. So uh, with respect to um, the, the, the gallery itself, correct? The, the, the physical experiences? Yeah. Okay. So, so with respect to uh, visual description, I mean, there's uh, a couple of different approaches here. And um, one of them is, and I apologize, the slides went out from underneath me. That's okay. Um, one, one approach is going to be um, that uh, the descriptions are um, at the image level. And so uh, what this means is that uh, things are, uh, at Canadian Museum for Human Rights, for example, uh, images have alt text. That's available not only on the website, but also in the galleries. Um, the galleries have uh, stop numbers. Uh, the, the different exhibits have stop numbers. These stop numbers offer a overview of the space. Uh, and again, it's something that is you know continuously being improved on. Uh, it was just up there uh, recently, and one of the things that uh, we were talking about is, hey, you know that visual overview I was talking about earlier? Why don't we include that as the first thing uh, before we go into talking about the space to then not only make it available for somebody who can see, but just help contextualize it for somebody just walking into the thing and wanting to know what's what's around me because maybe they didn't notice it visually for the first time. Um, uh, other aspects of description uh, are, are in uh, the digital space, so things like audio description for videos, right? So this is the case for, and I, I'm deviating from the No, slides it's the next, time. My next okay. bullet. Um, and so um, uh, uh, audio description refers to um, this idea. Well, let me ask you guys. Do you know what audio description is. Yeah. Okay, there were a lot fewer yeses on that one. So Wait, was there uh, a panel yesterday on that? There was. Okay, so, so that's a good reference. That's well. yeah, let, let's let's definitely refer to that, but very briefly just saying what's happening visually in the in the video. That's the major takeaway there. So audio description is uh, also used uh, as as well there. Um, today yeah, uh, I, well, and also I I I thought it's really encouraging the use of mechanical Turk to uh, to in the efforts to try to visually describe objects. So one of the things that I've been playing with recently and I'm hoping to play with a lot more is this idea of crowdsourcing, using the crowd to author image descriptions and doing so in a way that is meaningful. So in other words, you have to do multiple per image so you can get the quality up a little bit. And the other thing that I'm actually very interested in, we've played with a little bit, a buddy of mine, Carnegie Mellon, and I uh, did a, a three images, put them up on Mechanical Turk, got a couple of Turkers to describe them. But we asked them two questions instead of one. We asked them, hey, imagine you can't see how would you describe this image. We also said, think about how this image makes you feel. Describe that emotion. And what ended up happening is there was a lot of overlap in the the context that was offered by how this uh, image makes you feel, that mood or sentiment uh, information. That was really incredible. And one of the things I'd love to do is use that as a metric of evaluating image description. Mm -hmm. If we give an image description to somebody who can't see, would they actually get the same emotion out of the description that somebody would get visually? So just quickly, uh, would you say, Sina, as far as visual descriptions of objects should include some um, some interpretation on the emotion? This is a, you know, it's so personal, it's hard to know. It's, it's, so this is a tough one. Um, one of the things that we've been working with is with um, Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and uh, there's a system there that, that we built that... Uh, I, I, I don't have enough time to get into it now, but it's a, it's a workflow tool for, for image description. The major thing I really like about that particular system is that it offers you the ability to have multiple descriptions per image. Mm -hmm. So if you want the aesthetic uh, um, the description, if you want the long description, if you want the one that's more appropriate in an app or in a website menu context as opposed to an exhibit page context, you have that too. English versus French versus whatever. So this idea of, I think, one description to rule them all is a really, you know, it's a great sentiment, but I think we live in a flexible enough world these days where we, we can actually do a little bit better than that. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the mechanical tool. Uh-huh. 
um, sure, really briefly, Mechanical Turk, the question was, um, just for the recording, um, we mentioned Mechanical Turk, and we say what that is. Me Mechanical Turk is a, uh, uh, a website, um, uh, it's run by uh, Amazon, if I remember my, yep. my corporate structures correctly, right. and um, it allows you to put a task up there. The task can be anything. Um, uh, go to this web page and tell me who the CEO of the company is, or go to this Wikipedia article and tell me how many instances of the word blue exist, whatever the task is. And then it's outsourcing to humans, so it's using humans as as a, a, a computer, if you will. So it's, it's 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 people as a service in a way, right? And the the amazing part of it is that for at least the time being, for a little while longer, we are better at compute than computers at doing a couple of stuff like image recognition and patterns and stuff like that. So we just put up three images on there, and we put two questions with an edit field. That's it, and a submit button. That was it. And then they get thirty-five cents for each answer, something along those lines. So for a couple of bucks, we were able to evaluate the idea very simply of, hey, what if we just asked random people on the internet to describe uh, some images and gave them a few cents for each description? So uh, uh, just a couple of their best practices. Again, I think a Can Canadian Museum of Human Rights has used uh, sign language uh, descriptions. Both as English and French sign language. Uh, which is important in, in Canada, but you know, again, it, it, this gets complicated. Again, these would be videos of, of, of uh, people yes. signing. And then uh, video captions uh, really should be included. And in talking to Sina, I, I, I thought it was kind of interesting because I, I really forgot about video captions as an accessibility item. And the good news here is I forgot about it because we always do that. We always caption all our videos. So really it, getting sort of close to the call, uh, to the end here is, is to think about, can we get to a place with a universal design where we no longer have to even think about it? We are doing that. We are going to yeah. caption every video. So to me right now, it's kind of curb cuts and captions are these things that when there's not a curb cut, you're kind of annoyed. Yeah. You know, you're riding your bike and like, where, where's the curb cut? Yeah. You even realize things like, this is a kind of an annoying curb cut because it pushes me out into mm -hmm. the street and less going straight. So we're starting to share something in common with, yeah. with so, all users, you know. And I, I think that's just... Um, it's really important to realize that, um, well, two things I'll say really quickly on this. The first is that this becomes part of best practice. This becomes habit. And so it's not, oh my goodness, I have to do these additional 17 things when I offer, when I author a Word document. Like for example, anybody here made text big in a Word document behind a paragraph, just to label the paragraph, like introduction or abstract. Have you guys done that? Okay, so again, the nodding. Come on, work yeah. with me here. No, there was right. nobody. Nobody wanted okay. to say. Okay, nobody no. wanted to say. Right. <laughs> so here's the thing, though. The best way to do that is not to do that. Right. It's to use styles in Word to actually make that a heading, because then I can navigate them by heading. Okay. So it's it's that difference of doing something visually versus doing it semantically. But then you start realizing when you do that, it's actually very beneficial. Forget somebody who's blind reading your document. It, you can auto generate the table of contents that way. So you get all of these emergent benefits to not only the organization, but on an individual basis that I think are, are really important. And then of course there's this awesome side effect of the inclusive design aspect to it. So all of that is, is great. I hope you feel really inspired by that. But I do want to mention that there was a, a really important piece of legislation that passed, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we're seeing more and more in D.C. and elsewhere where activists and other people are going around to museums, and they're starting to complain. And when they complain, the Justice Department comes in. So recently at the news museum and other museums, we've seen where they have to redesign their exhibits to comply. So more and more, it's not just a best practice because we should be doing it. We really... We've, we're going to have the Justice Department looking at it as well, you know. And again, I don't mean to scare people off, but it's like the right thing to do. The legislation was passed for the right reasons. Right now, for me, the legislation has kind of meant that we're captioning videos because it really was. We wanted to make things accessible, yeah. but we were quite aware of, of, of that obvious lack when we didn't do it. Yeah, I mean, it's, look, this stuff is important, and I usually don't lead with the law. It's very yeah. important. I didn't lead with it. No, no, I know. And, and, and but, but, the, the thing is that there is this legal aspect to it. And so that does sometimes at least offer an, um, a, a way of starting the conversation internally, especially with executive management or in-house legal and things like that. And you can use this to your advantage as well, right? So it's not just you. When you work with a software developer, 
include that as a requirement in your statement of work or in your contract. Say that this needs to be WCAG compliant, WCAG 2.0 AA compliant if you're doing a website, or follow best accessibility, best practices for accessibility when doing an Android or an iOS app. It's, it's little things like that that you can actually weave into your existing practices and even policies so that you can use it um, as, this, as this good foundation of promoting an accessible uh, culture. But to Dan's point, you know what, this is important and it is actually a legal mandate as well, especially whenever talking about federal funds or grants or things like that. So a call to action. Uh, we really want to think of all audiences, not just the audiences that you, you want or you expect. You can lead your way since sure. it's really your slide. Sure. Okay. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, as Dan said, you know, think of all audiences. Um, the uh, view accessibility um, as uh, basically an opportunity, right? This yeah. stuff can be really cool sometimes. Um, I mean, if you ask me all the time, but you know, I'm biased. <laughs> so the thing is, uh, there's all sorts of neat ways of interacting with information these days, from people who use head tilts to, to author emails. I, I have a buddy who can extract words out of somebody's brain so that they can send uh, emails to loved ones because they have locked in syndrome and can't move anything, not even a jaw muscle. And we can use computers to actually allow that person to communicate. So this stuff gets really cool really fast and when you start thinking about the little things that you can do that have this multiple this order of magnitude uh, impact as a result of doing that little thing like using styles in a word document or making your website accessible I think that's that's really meaningful and helps sustain it right um, embrace new technologies first not last this idea that uh, you know okay well let's let's wait 10 years and then you know we'll, we'll figure it out or oh my goodness it's a touch screen it has no buttons how could somebody who's blind use that uh, it that's that's not the case so so go for go for embracing emerging technologies and at least play with it and discover how that might be able to help as opposed to hinder. Uh, spread the word. So if you think that the stuff's interesting, you know, uh, talk about it. Talk about it with your colleagues. Talk about it with your, uh, you know, friends and family. And you'll say, oh, you know, you'll, you'll have these conversations that say, oh, wait, no, I knew this uh, blind person that was, you know, a lawyer or something like. And, and it just leads to these uh, different conversations. But it also leads to an awareness thing because I, I don't take the opinion of, or I don't take the approach of. Ugh, these people don't have an accessible website. Like, you know, it's just, you know, and then getting mad about it, right? That, that's, to me, not the, the strategy I tend to follow. It's uh, oftentimes, wow, they had no idea that, you know, people will tell me, I didn't even know that you could uh, use the web, right? And it's, that's fine. Now, now you do. So, you know, fix it. <laughs> so that's the, that's, the, that's the idea there. The one thing uh, I will uh, say, and we have the quote by Maya Angelou that I said last night as well on, on, on the screen, but the one thing I, I, I will also add to this is incorporate accessibility into your QA process. And it doesn't have to be software for quality yeah. assurance. Just make it a check as well as something that you do so that when you do it later on, or if you accidentally forget to, because we all do, then it's a check. And so the product doesn't get launched without, or it, the, the new document doesn't go out with, without headings, things like that. Make Build it into the check, not just something you do once, because then it'll slowly evaporate over time. And we don't want that to happen. Well, and the other thing as far as working with mobile technologies and accessibility, it's, I won't say impossible, but it's extremely difficult to, to evaluate these without working with, with blind people or people who are really super familiar with, with the, with the, with the um, tools that Apple and others have given uh, for accessibility. So we, we learned a lot that way, and I just, you know, if you've tried to to move around without much experience using voiceover, it's um it's a whole nother uh, way of of experiencing the app. I, I do want to make uh, I, I just want to echo that distinction really quick. So there's there's testing with users, which you should always do. I, I, I don't care if they're blind, people of color, old, young, it doesn't matter. That's that's always a thing you should do. But then when doing the development process, when talking about accessibility, work with somebody not just a power user of accessibility right. technologies, right? But somebody who actually knows accessibility. If that's me, awesome. If it's somebody else, even better, right? It, the idea here is that you want to make sure that you don't just assume, oh, you're blind and use a screen reader, or you're deaf and read captions all the time. You must know how to do captions correctly. Uh, don't don't conflate these two things. Those people are great for validation, but during development, make sure you work with somebody who actually knows accessibility so that they can tell you about other audiences as well, not just the one that, that they have the most expertise in. Well, thank you very much for um, for staying for this session. Um, if there are questions, we, we're, we're happy to take them. I always have a lot of questions, but uh, so if you don't have any, I'll ask them. <laughs>
One one questions I have is I would love to hear about any instances of foot braille or or this being used in galleries, how it's been used in galleries to maybe uh, let let you know that there's something nearby, um, textural changes, uh, what successes you've met, and I would imagine some resistance maybe with with designers. Sina, do you know of any? I'll, I'll do one. All right. Yeah. So um, in the in Winnipeg, in Canadian Museum for Human Rights, one of the things that they have is the universal keypad at different exhibits. So this is the way that the touchscreen becomes accessible and, and other things like that. There is a bump. There's a there's a rectangular um, uh, a lift on the floor uh, that your your cane will hit or your feet will hit. That if you then follow to you know uh, along the uh, along the path, it'll it'll hit a wall or it'll hit a table, something like that. And that's where the keypad is. So instead of just like groping around the table looking all blind, right? You can just you know find the bump and yeah, I'm allowed to say that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know like uh, you know just you can find the bump you know with your cane or whatnot, and then you know okay, it's got to be to my left because this is I'm following it to the exhibit. Of it. So it's a it's a subtle thing. It doesn't get in the way of a wheelchair user or trip somebody up. It's not that high up, but it's just really distinctive that way. Uh, yeah, Jim. Pat Dorsey on Twitter wants to know if the speakers distinguish between inclusive design and universal design. <sighs> I I I don't I I, I I suppose that definitionally speaking, universal design is uh, the set of rules, the seven principles we laid out. Uh, it came from uh, the Center for Universal Design at NC State about 20, 30 years ago. Um, it, it, before that, it was codified from uh, architecture and building codes in the 60s and 70s. It was originally focused on persons with disabilities. I will say that. Whereas I think these days, as a community of technologists and people who just care about this stuff, we sort of repurposed it to be what we refer to as inclusive design, which is this idea that uh, it's not just for somebody who can't see or somebody who uh, uh, walks with crutches or something along those lines. It's just this approach to development, whether we're talking about content, technology, buildings, whatever, that is inclusive of as many audiences as possible. Yeah, Jason. Okay, so a couple of things. Uh, number one, I didn't repeat the question on the previous one. So Jim asked from Twitter, uh, what they, uh, do, do we differentiate between inclusive and universal design? Then your question regarding what are some developer resources that is helpful for understanding how somebody who's blind uses a touch screen or somebody who's a switch user uses, a, uses an iPad. Um, there's a couple of things. So uh, I'm a developer, so number one, uh, find me afterwards. Let's definitely talk in, in, in more detail. But but there are uh, some resources that I can um, start tweeting out you know, under the MCN 2015 hashtag and other things uh, that are like top five checklists. Apple has great accessibility documentation on their website. So what is it, developer.apple.com. And then there's an entire accessibility track on there for things like labeling buttons, hints, traits, uh, object roles like button you know, versus link, uh, you, you, you name it, all of those. Um, um, the voiceover utility on iOS itself has a tutorial mode. So if you want to play it, play with it. And like, what happens when I do this gesture? What happens when I turn two fingers, like a you know a knob gesture? Uh, you can you can do that in in settings, general accessibility, voiceover. There's a tutorial tool right there. Um, other things would be to um, like you said. Look at some YouTube videos. I'll, I'll, I'll try to find some some appropriate ones, and if if not, I'll I'll just go make one. Um, of of things where you can watch and observe people with various functional abilities using this technology. The thing I'll say though is that sometimes can be I don't I don't want to say misleading, but it's almost beside the point, right? It's incredibly important that you do that, and I want you to go do that. But the thing is, when you're writing code, I don't want you to think, will this work for somebody who's blind? That should be the internal check. But I want you to think, I need to just code this button correctly, which means not styling something else and then calling it a button, really using a button, for example, in HTML, right? Not just making a div with CSS look like a button. That's the important thing. Uh, and that way, it's better for everybody, not just the few audiences that you might have some, some experience with. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that's helpful. Right. Question over here. 
Oh, yeah. Um, this is also from Twitter, Max Marmer of the Press Foundation. Mm -hmm. So, um, with respect to an organization, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume with, with respect to an organization that, you know, is accessible or, or whatnot, um, you know, nothing specific comes to mind. This is one of those questions where you say that and then, like, uh, you know, somebody totally leaves a comment, like, how did you not mention this? <laughs> um, yeah. but, but, you know, the, the <laughs> thing is it's, it's a little hard, right? You can evaluate against existing guidelines. <laughs> WCAG, for example, uh, there's A, double A, and triple A. So when we do website evaluations for folks, we'll say, okay, what's the level we're going for? You know, we'll have a discussion with the developers and the stakeholders, and then we'll do a double A evaluation. So there's a set of functional criteria there, and from a certification point of view, you can say, all right, well, I passed all of the double A checks. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very meaningful. Uh, things like code validation are very meaningful, but the, the idea of having a certificate is really hard. And the reason it is, this actually started to exist in the 90s and early 2000s. It was something called Bobby, for example, like bane of most people's existence, because it was an automated check that was horrendous, to be perfectly honest. And the thing was that then it's only true for when you do it. So tomorrow, when you go to update that blog post, when you go to change something, it's no longer true, so that it doesn't it doesn't matter, right? So I think if we did talk about accreditation, it would almost have to be like um, uh, what is it, C CMMI or, or 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 whatnot for project management and things like that, where it would almost have to be an evaluation of practices to ensure that that's a meaningful statement about the organization. Before we close, and we just have a few seconds left here, I just wanted to mention that um, there 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 is a tendency to um, to uh, have features that we uh, are accessible or are implemented when, um, like, say, voiceover is on. So you say, well, I know when voiceover is vo on, this app is going to act differently mm -hmm. because I know a blind user is using it. Mm -hmm. The same By the same token, oftentimes you say, I'm going to set my app to go to automatically the language in which the user is using mm -hmm. it so they can access other languages. So the limitation there is, at least for the language, I'll talk about that, is sometimes people don't have their, yeah. their, vo their phone set in the language that they may wish to hear it in. They may be French speakers, but they're in America, so it's spent in English. They didn't realize that they could have had the whole thing mm -hmm. in French, mm -hmm. so they missed that. And then I'm sure you can give some examples of voiceover uh, functionality that's only, you know. So, so really quick, I mean, it, it does sometimes have advantages. Um, it, for example, one of the things you can do is maybe there's a bunch of read more links and you can auto expand the content for, for a blind user, uh, it, different aspects like that. But the idea is, the second you start doing that, you start deviating towards a separate thing, right? Uh, and, and this whole idea of separate not being equal. So sometimes, from a developer point of view, uh, it is occasionally helpful. You can make some different code decisions. But when we start talking at the feature level, you want to be very careful. A lot of folks might not have voiceover on. I, I have a couple of buddies who they only turn on voiceover they w when they want to read long text. But then they turn it back off because they have enough usable vision when the font is large enough to use the rest of the interface. But they do use voiceover for those little periods. And if you did the check at the beginning of your app, well, th they don't get that advantage of whatever different thing you're going to do when you do that check. So be very careful when, when, when making automatic decisions like that. And again, based on universal design, make it a, 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 an undoable thing, right? Or, or make it a user option that can at least be uh, affected, such as a language picker or something. So just in case you guessed wrong or detected wrong. Thanks very much. Thank Appreciate you, guys. It.